correlated these two users are. Yes? Uh, step four, why don't we take the absolute value of the correlation? Absolute, okay, so uh, that's a very good point. This is the reason. If I uh, have opposite taste to you, right? And I like, say, an action movie, right? Then, if you have opposite taste of me, you are likely to dislike that movie. So, if we want to leverage both, if uh, we do have, so, uh, hmm, how would I explain this? That's a very uh, good uh, uh, point. Let me think of one uh, second. So, okay. So, say you have a boy who likes uh, all uh, movies with lots of fighting and violence, right? And you have a girl that um, uh, that likes romantic comedies and doesn't like violence, right? Let's run the uh, usual stereotypes, uh, being politically incorrect at the moment for the purpose <laughs> of explanation. And I want, and there is a romantic comedy, right? And I want to guess how much will the boy like this romantic comedy, right? Well, I want to leverage the fact that that particular user will strongly, uh, he has opposite tastes of the girl, right? So the fact that this girl liked very much the romantic comedy is negative impact, should have negative impact on how much the boy will like it. So we are looking just for significant values of either sign. So if you have two people with similar interests, then this guy liking a movie should cause, uh, it makes it likely that this guy will also like that movie. But if I have a user like this, right, with opposite taste, right, then if this user uh, dislikes this movie, it should be the, uh, also, um, uh, should increase the ranking here, and opposite, if this user likes certain movie, it should have negative impact on this user because they have opposite tests. So you leverage whenever two vectors have high absolute value of the correlation between them, right? Because that's significant information. If you have something like this, well, this is kind of orthogonal uh, view, so neither it should increase nor decrease the uh, score for this guy, right? Simply because uh, the, uh, the likings of this user are uncorrelated to the uh, likings of this user. So for that reason, we, uh, we deem that this impact of this will be significant only if this is either large positive value or large, or you know, by absolute value, large positive value, or by absolute value, large negative value, then uh, his ranking, if it's of opposite sign, then high ranking of this user uh, that is negatively correlated will have negative impact on the guest ranking of the other user. So we want to leverage both positive correlation and uh, negative correlations. Uh, uh, now, notice, uh, okay, so this is the, what's the difference between, say, an algorithm in uh, signal processing and an algorithm that is of the form of a recommender system? You see, usually we have pretty exact models of signals uh, Right, they can be represented as linear, sorry, band-limited signals. Signals that have limited bandwidth, like sound, right? 
uh, you cannot have anything above 20 kilohertz that you can hear. Uh, so we look at signals whose highest frequency is uh, 20 kilohertz. And we have very accurate models that capture such, uh, such signals. Uh, and consequently, the algorithms are seldom heuristics. There are some, but they are seldom heuristics. They are usually based on accurate uh, analytic com computations using applied harmonic analysis, right? Uh, also in physics, you know, uh, you know, force is always exactly mass time acceleration, and there is no plus minus 10%, right? When it comes to humans, uh, there are no exact algorithms, right? Because we, what does it mean? A person likes a movie. That is totally subjective and unmeasurable uh, quantity. So most of the algorithms that we use uh, uh, are heuristic, and then we test them and see whether they work well in practice or not on empirically obtained samples. So in particular, how do you test a recommender system? It's very simple. So Netflix had a sample data that contained, uh, I think, several hundreds of thousands of users and uh, several tens of thousands of movies. Uh, that was about 1% field. Then they covered a few existing ratings, uh, right? And uh, give you that truncated table. Then the recommender system computes using some of these uh, algorithms like that, estimates uh, what should sit here. Of course, once you find this weighted average, where is it? Right? It's now easy, of course, for recommending something, that's all what you need. Uh, you need, uh, you will pick the movies for which this is large. But if you want to estimate absolute rankings that are in the table, of course you then do uh, rho uh, up, let's call it star, will be uh, rho up uh, plus, uh, how did we call the total bias, was it uh, rho zero, plus rho zero plus bu plus bi, everything that we subtracted, right? And this number is then the estimate what should sit here. And then Netflix simply compared the predicted values, right, with the, the uh, values that they actually had, but hid the, them from you. And the uh, root square mean of the difference of predicted values and true values is then taken as the estimate of uh, accuracy. And actually, uh, I think the movies were ranked uh, uh, between on 1 to 10 scale, and the uh, error was less than 1, I think. Uh, so it was pretty accurate uh, uh, prediction, right? So this is one type. Of course, now you can switch the roles of users uh, and uh, movies. So, so here we looked for the similar users uh, to recommend uh, uh, high-ranking movies of similar users who have not, uh, who have seen that movie that you want to uh, recommend, right? So. Um, you can turn the tables now and consider movies and then look at the correlation between these scores, right? But not over um, uh, you for the two users, but between the movies, right? And then uh, when you find, say, if you find highly correlated movies, you pick among them highest ranking ones that this user hasn't seen. Of course, you don't just pick, you again form a weighted average, so you will guess what is here by weighted average 
of uh, known uh, Marx, uh, right, for movies that are uh, highly correlated to uh, that movie, right? So you can do, uh, you can leverage both correlation between users and you can combine, you can compute both recommendations and take the mean, for example. As I say, all this is kind of hodgepodge algorithms. <coughs> and for that reason, you know, the winning algorithm was a uh, combination of weighted scores of hundreds of algorithms. And it was useless because it was a very slow, but uh, the efficiency was not a requirement for uh, Netflix. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, <coughs> uh, the winning uh, algorithm beat the second winning algorithm only by being submitted a few hours before the other algorithm, but the errors were exactly the same. Yes? Um, the correlation formula, is that, that's the estimate of the correlation, right? Sorry? Like it's the estimate of correlation. Mm -hmm. it, so where to be biased? Sorry, sorry. Like, <laughs> where, like where in the correlation estimate be biased by the number? Uh, uh, by the size of the overlap, huh? By the size of the vector. Yeah, well, that's, this is why we do this, uh, uh, this step, uh, right, to remove the size of the support. And it's kind of, you might want to leave uh, some fraction of this in, you know, to kind of give highest, higher weight to, uh, you know, if you have two users and they, totally agree on rankings, but they have seen together only two movies, both of them, the same movies, they share only two rankings. Even if they exactly agree, would you call their taste the same? That's clearly dubious because the, set of the sample from which their uh, similarity is evaluated is uh, uh, really, really small. So it, it would kind of uh, it would make sense to allow for, uh, to, for the size of the support to have impact, uh, right? But, um, yeah, as I say, this is all a bit of black magic, uh, and it is not, um, it is not really an exact uh, uh, science, but, you know, the, the amazing thing is that this algorithm perform extremely well in practice. Uh, so, and that's the ultimate criterion for an algorithm, for uh, the usefulness of an algorithm. Uh, okay, so this is one approach. Now, the winning algorithm, the main second component of the winning algorithm is uh, something called uh, latent factor method. Or factors method. And actually, it tends to overperform over the neighborhood uh, method, but its computation is actually much trickier. Okay, so let's see what the idea is. Now, um, you have a certain number of users, right? And huge number of movies. So what you might want to do is to find just a few categories, say on average this is less than 200, and some of the best algorithms for Netflix challenge have this size varying, if I remember correctly, between 20 and 200, right? Uh, and so the idea would be the following. You have these ratings of a user, and from the ratings, you want to compute taste of a user according to certain categories. For example, uh, does this movie involve lots of action? How would you compute 
uh, the, uh, the categories. Uh, okay, so uh, sorry, this is a user, and this is his taste. Here you would put a number that would indicate how much he likes action movies. How would you do that? Well, you would compute the mean of the scores that he has given to particular movie that have a lot of action, right? And you put, say here, say 8 out of 10, how much he likes action. Then the second category would be, um, uh, is there a romantic story in the movie? You again look at all movies that he has seen, you identify those that have romantic story, average their score, and again you get an estimate uh, uh, for this quality of the movie. Then you might uh, have a, a category like, is it um, a domestic Australian movie or is it Hollywood movie? Again, you cal calculate mean scores, and you do this over, say, 200 quantities, uh, right? Then you build a similar table, but for all movies. Uh, so here are users, right? And here will be movies, uh, right? And for each movie, right? You have exactly the same categories here. So these are categories, right? And here are categories. So, for example, here you would put, does this movie involve lots of action? Say it involves about level eight. Does it have a good romantic story? No, and then it will get a score one. Then the third is whatever, is it Australian or is it Hollywood movie or whatever, right? And now to, you can guess the rating of that this user would give to that movie by simply finding scalar product between, uh, uh, let's call this uh, uh, L, uh, vector of this, so to speak, latent factors, because they are, you will see why they are called. So L of the movie times L, sorry, L of the user times L of the item just the scalar product, so this would be sum of u over uh, factor f times uh, uh, item factor f when f goes between 1 and 200, right? And the idea is this. Uh, this guy likes a lot movies that have lots of action, and lo and behold, this movie has lots of action, so the user, uh, this should contribute a lot. If he likes a lot uh, action movies, but there is no uh, action in the movie, then uh, his, his, the product between the two will be small, right? So this multiplies how much of certain quality the user likes times how much of a quality a particular um, item has and simply sums them up in total, right? So if I like a lot action movies, I say this is nine and uh, uh, this uh, item has a lot of action nine, the contribution of this component would be nine times nine plus say, uh, I, I do not uh, like um, a, a romantic story, but the, uh, the movie did have a, a large, important romantic story in it. This will add only nine, right? And vice versa, if I like romantic stories, but the movie has little romantic story in it, uh, then uh, the contribution will be uh, small. And you use this 
uh, to as your guess for rho of u i. Right? Yes. Sorry, say it again. Uh, would it make more, di like, more sense to compare the, um, the difference between the two vectors instead of like, taking the one point Um The difference, well, uh, you see, if, uh, if, it's, uh, if I like uh, a lot action movies and the component is large, if I take the difference, it will cancel out. So you want that largest largeness of these two increases. Um, but if it takes a difference, then it's, it's going to be like the distance, right? So uh, that, this is kind of, it is angle between these two vectors again. So if my vectors of preference points into the same direction as the vector of qualities of the movie, I want it to have large uh, uh, impact. Uh, okay. Now, what do you think? What's the problem with this approach? How do you know what the user likes? Exactly. It will be pretty tricky to figure out, first, what the, car the right categories are. And secondly, uh, you would need human help to categorize how much of each uh, a category a movie uh, has. Well, I guess one can take a rough estimate by finding, but still you would have to categorize the movies uh, according to each of the qualities. So this uh, uh, looks kind of dead end, but this is an ingenious now trick. We say let these categories emerge from the data. And we don't even have to understand what they are. How do we do that? We simply say um, the following. Let us simply take for each user, we can have for this quality uh, we can have um, we can have for each quality we can do the following. So we are going to say the following. Each user, each of these entries. Right? Will be a variable. And each of these entries will be also a variable. Right? So for each user, you will have variables, uh, say, uh, x1, x2, xl, and a superscript is user where L is, uh, say, 200. So each user gets 200 variables. And each movie I gets uh, Y1 I, Y2 I, all the way to Y I. 200, right? So they are all variables. And then I will look so and what I want now to have is that row ui will be simply the dot product of, uh, will be simply the dot product of these two vectors, so it will be, let's call this uh, x u, and let's call this y i, so we take rho u i to be simply the dot product of x u, 
and yi, which is of course equal to the sum of uh, um, x uh, x uh, u uh, l times y i l, where l goes between 1 and 200, right? Now, let's count how many variables I have, right? I have a number of users times 200, right? Plus number of uh, items times 200, which is 200 times cardinality of all users plus cardinality of all items. You take this number of categories so that this number of variables is about, say, one half or one third uh, of the total number of entries in my table. So this is the table of raw <coughs> UIs. Right? And I simply minimize. So how do I now find the values of the, cat of the x's and y's? I minimize, I find minimum um, of uh, over all users and all items of row ui minus uh, this dot product uh, x u times y i squared, right? In effect, what am I doing can be described in matrix algebra very simple. Given a large sparse matrix, right? I want to find two matrices, one that is skinny and tall, this is the cardinality of the all users, this is relatively small, say 200 or less, and another long but short matrix of size 200 by the cardinality of all items, such that when I multiply these, right, I will get a matrix of the size of number of users times number of items. And among all such possible matrices with positive uh, entries, all positive entries, uh, I find one so that when I look at the positions for which I do have uh, the ratings of users, uh, some of the squares of the difference between this matrix and my original matrix, right? Some of the squares of these differences, uh, right? Uh, this guest, uh, let's call it, uh, how do we call it? I'm out of symbols, uh, triangle, raw triangle. So this is essentially, you are minimizing over all u and i, uh, rho u i minus rho triangle u i squared over all u i such that u has uh, ranked, uh, rated item i. This is why it's called latent factor. You might now ask, and people have made this objection. It says, what's the value of your method if we don't know what this stands for? Well, a good answer for this is 
We don't care that we don't know what they stand for. We simply find among all possible factorizations of this sparse matrix into two skinny, almost one dimensional matrices, right? It's kind of, this size is very small, that gets as close as possible to the original matrix in the sense of RMS over all known values. Do you understand how this works? So you have a standing matrix that has the recommendations, the ratings, uh, 1 to 10, say, stars, on some points. Then I take a tall matrix, but narrow, and a long matrix, but short, right? And fill them with numbers. So that when I multiply these two matrices, I get a matrix of appropriate size. And at the positions for which I do have information, some of the squares of my prediction through this matrix multiplication and existing values, the error is as small as possible. Yes? Are you kind of finding like the 200 variables that are the most independent that can make up the... Essentially, that's, it is, in fact, kind of finding a few independent dimensions. This can be even uh, formalized. Uh, you know, you are kind of, um, uh, yeah, projecting your, you know, it's essentially you look at your cloud of points and you want to find a subspace of dimension 200 so that when you project on this subspace, uh, the errors are as small as possible. That's correct. Yeah, you can see it that way. Right. So, um, uh, and people object that we talk. Okay. So now, one would say, "Gee, that's beautiful. We reduce this to least square problem," but we didn't reduced to a linear least square problem because now both use both axes where is here. Both of these are variables. So this is actually a problem of fourth degree. And worse, unfortunately, it doesn't even have to be what's called convex. Because for convex problems, uh, we have fast algorithms for optimization, and if the problem is not convex, then we are in trouble. What is the convexity? Let me just briefly remind you. A set is convex if whenever you take two points, when you connect the two points, all points on the segment are inside. So this is a convex, but this is obviously not a convex set. So this is the definition of convexity of a set. The whole uh, segment has to be inside. And the function is convex if the value of the function at any point is larger than the linear, appropriate linear combinations of the value. So you put a line between these two values, and then the values of your function have to be all above these linear uh, combinations, right? So it's all above that segment. And the problem is convex if both the domain and the function are convex. And unfortunately, this uh, is not a convex problem. But guess what? Uh, we do what horrifies mathematicians, right? OK, the problem is not convex, but we hack it. And if it works in practice, who cares that the problem was not convex, right? Um, and the idea how this is done is important trick that is used in just vast number of fields, uh, including signal processing, all sorts of things. It's called iterative projections. This is how you do it. Huh? You start by putting ones here in the entire matrix. 
and you put variables only here. Now, in this product, one of these two factors, the axis, will be constant. So, lo and behold, this turns into a linear combination of y's. So, this is just a linear least square problem. You find the values here <coughs> that minimize this difference when you find the product of these two matrices. Okay? Now what you do, you take thus obtained values, optimal values, and you fix them. And you put variables everywhere here. And you again perform the optimization. Once you get these better values here, you put, again, variables here, find the product, find the values of the variables that minimizes this, and you keep this flip-flopping until the values stabilize. Well, the problem is they can easily stabilize in a local extrema rather than global extrema because the problem is not convex. But get, guess what? In uh, even this uh, local extrema turns out to be reasonably good in practically tasted, uh, tested cases. Uh, so it's really ugly and it's totally unscientific. But if it makes money for Amazon, we tend to ignore that we don't uh, understand. Neither do we have interpretation of the categories and we don't even care that the uh, uh, minima might be just a local minima. We give it a try whether it go, provides good recommendations. How do we test each method? Always the same trick. You take a large sample, you screen out, you block some of the entries, you apply your algorithm to guess the values on the entries and see what is the RMS of the error. Yes? Yes. Right. Um, when, once you have problems with symmetry, then the thing is that if every field in the vector is one, then uh, the optimal value for y is already the same vector. Uh, no, because you see the trick is these guys are randomly interspersed. So does, it's true when you put all the ones here, then as you uh, multiply, it will simply sum up the variables, right? And then you compare this with the entries.